Today's topic, uh, and I think the event comes at a very opportune time um, here, here in Washington, really comes as we're beginning to see a critical mass of players, uh, the African Development Bank, development institutions, African governments, international organizations and, and donors uh, start to focus in this very serious way on the energy sector, on, on bringing electricity access um, to Africa. Um, Obviously, there's, there's been a recognition, long-standing recognition, uh, that energy and electricity access um, has, has had a tremendous, been a, or the lack of, has had a tremendous drag on African growth and on improvements in uh, human development and education, health, livelihoods, and poverty alleviation. So there are big new initiatives. The African Development Bank has made this a key focus. The World Bank has, 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 has also made this a big focus. The International Finance Corporation, a huge amount of its Africa portfolio is focused on, on energy and power generation, <clears throat> sustainable energy for all, <clears throat> and most recently, the U.S. Power Africa Initiative, which is really the first time that the U.S. has begun to, to focus its efforts on kind of the pi private public partnership in, in, in driving electricity access. Um, and I think as this critical mass of interest grows, uh, there's a need to build in really from the start uh, an understanding of the particular challenges, uh, the needs and circumstances of women um, in, in electricity access who bear in so many instances the lion's share of the backbreaking work in, in, in smallholder farming, in cooking, in collecting fuel and water. <clears throat> huge amounts of time spent in that, in child rearing, so education, health, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and as with water access, I think uh, investing in the ways that alleviate this, that burden uh, improve on women, improves productivity, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it frees up their time, gives opportunity for livelihood diversification, uh, uh, and so forth. So this is not a, a niche topic, it's a huge development opportunity to build the needs and circumstances of women into these initiatives early on. Um, second, this is a time that there's growing interest and need in the U.S. to get U.S. entrepreneurs and investors thinking about opportunities in Africa. Uh, and there's huge opportunities for creative thinkers, uh, for social impact investors, and for for-profit investors um, to, to engage in new ways and expand their ties on the continent. Uh, opportunities are growing, and that's driving a healthy competition with, with others, and I think the U.S. does not want to get left behind in, in that competition. Um, so I hope, uh, I think U.S. investors generally have been less aware of the opportunities, kind of more frightened by the, you know, and, and over-calculation in some instances of risks. And I hope today that we can play a small role, in, 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 particularly in our third panel, in looking at what are the opportunities for smart investments that have both development uh, impact uh, and, um, and, 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 and work at and a business uh, business viability. Um, our first panel today is going to be on the question of energy access for women. Again, this is, this is fairly, you know, it's, it's a fairly new time to, to be talking about this, although our panelists have been talking about this for a very long time. Uh, water access, which has gotten more attention, I think, in the past than energy access, will be our, our second panel. And our third panel is looking at what are the opportunities, what might be some of the platforms for diaspora and, and U.S. more generally um, to be finding opportunities to engage in these. At the end, we're going to show a short film. Uh, Marilyn Smith of the Energy Action Project is going to introduce the premiere of a film, Darkness, uh, which talks about the impacts of, of uh, uh, energy poverty uh, and is quite compelling in a very short film and that I hope you'll, you'll all stay to, to watch. Let me just turn over to Frank. I'm so glad to see you here and I'm really grateful to our panelists today and for the topic that we're going to be addressing. So Frank. Good morning and welcome to CSIS. So uh, <laughs> Jennifer has provided the substance and play-by-play. -play. I'm here to do the color commentary. 
And let me just tell you, when we first started talking about this and the fact that we rescheduled it, so I thank you all for turning out on our postponed event. And when I saw the weather this morning, I actually thought that the next time we do this, it'll be energy, water, and weather forecasting. <laughs> Amazing. Um, we do expect, because we've gotten a number of emails that folks coming in, especially from Northern Virginia, are having horrible trouble getting here. So I, I expect that the crowd will fill out, but we just thought we needed to get started. Let me just say, um, it's been a great progress uh, that we've made moving this forward, but it really was Tim Rashenda, and I've got to say the same thing that um, Jennifer said in terms of Lawrence Jones. So I've known Dr. Jones for several years now, um, from when he used to send me emails about Liberia, and then we started talking about energy issues. I serve, and I'm proud to serve on as an advisory director on his board. Um, I'm also on the board of, of the Nomad Foundation, when, and like a lot of other NGOs, we work in Niger with the Tuareg. And NGOs frequently think that they've got it all covered, right? So when we first went into this country, these are nomadic herbsmen, herbsmen. They need water, they need medical facilities, they need food. So we started food banks, we bought cattle and goats, right? We drilled water wells, these are all good things. We built schools and medical facilities. And we found quite early on that even though we had the schools, people weren't coming to the schools. And the reason was the children spend so much time pumping the water well and then carrying the water in buckets and jars back for their irrigation and to feed the families and their crops and also their animals, right? So then we put in solar facilities, which uh, so solar pumps were actually a good thing. So the water was flowing 24 hours a day, practically. It freed the children up. And we found that it actually helped spur an entirely new industry of uh, solar panel assembly, installation, and then uh, maintenance and repair. So these are all good things. Children still weren't coming to the schools. So I've covered kind of the energy and water piece, and then we, we got smart enough to go to the women and mothers of the groups that we were dealing with. And they said, you know, if you would add breakfast to the curriculum, the children will show up. And so sure enough, by doing something similar or simple like that, now we have the schools full as well. But it's been an extraordinary experience. Uh, Lawrence, uh, anyone that knows him, this notion of um, enthusiasm that's undaunted and persistence and substance is just a joy to work with. Um, and Tim and Rashinda the same way. So we're really looking forward to this day. I have found throughout my career that humility, listening and learning are always good things. And I don't want to lose that, so that's what I expect to do for the remainder of the morning <laughs> and come off better for it. The first panel, as Jennifer lined out, so Rashinda is going to moderate the first panel. Um, I'll introduce her and then let her introduce the panel. In your programs, there's actually an extensive bios on all of our speakers, and it really is an extraordinary group. But Rashinda Van Leeuwen is executive director of the Energy Access Initiative, and she leads the UN Foundation work on energy access and its engagement with the UN Sustainable Energy, uh, the Energy for All initiative. She founded and leads the, the United Nations Foundation Energy Access Practitioner Network, which was launched back in 2011. She joined the UN Foundation in 2010 from Global Energies. It was a global renewable energy private equity firm where she led its work both on commercial emerging markets and renewable energy investments. She also served as a founding board member for the Good Energies Foundation, focusing on the application of renewable energy technologies for poverty alleviation in developing countries. And prior to this, she served as executive director of Trickle Up. She has extensive background and knowledge on this subject, as do all of our commenters and panelists today. And I'm so grateful that you're here today. I welcome you to CSIS and Rashinda. Take over the program at this point, and we'll be back to join you later. But thank you all for coming. Thanks very much, uh, Frank and Jennifer, for those kind introductions, and um, to all of you, again, for, for joining us for this really important uh, um, discussion uh, today. Um, before I introduce the panelists, I just want to say a couple of remarks to set the stage a little bit further um, from the standpoint of sustainable energy for all, and um, I hope that uh, Venkat in particular will, will also um, contribute to talking a little bit about the broad scope because I recognize that some of you may be coming um, slightly newer to this subject area. And so just, just by way of background, um, some sort of high level um, framework setting um, globally, 
there's still about between 1.2 to 1.3 billion people globally who don't have access to electricity and this, the development benefits that derive from having that access. Um, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, in Africa as a whole, there's something, again, data is not exact, but something approaching about 500 million people who don't have um, regular and reliable access to electricity. And it's predominantly, but not exclusively, a, a rural issue. Um, and of course, it affects households, it affects communities, and, uh, um, and yet at the same time, um, particularly as we've already heard in just some of the introductory comments, there is very much a, a focus on um, some of the differential ways that it affects women um, in, their, in their homes and in their businesses and communities in particular. Um, and we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about that uh, um, particularly, and I'm delighted this morning to, to have uh, three just um, tremendously experienced panelists to, to help us sort of un unpackage that uh, issue and, and really to talk about why, in fact, we should be focusing particularly on women's experience, but also on the flip side of the equation, uh, what women have to offer, uh, what are the opportunities, how women can engage in being part of the solution, um, and not only um, in terms of being the beneficiaries, if you will, of, of improvements uh, in their local environment and their household access. So without further ado, um, I'm delighted to uh, introduce our panel this morning. From my left, um, Venkat uh, Ramanaputi um, is from the, the World Bank. Um, and uh, I, I, I know Venkat, so I don't want to look to, to his bio too much, but he's just been a tremendous um, uh, resource uh, for many years at the World Bank through the SMAP program, the energy program. He's a manager there. Um, he's been a long time um, supporter, engager, um, catalyst for a, a whole range of work on on different energy issues. Um, and I'm just delighted that we have two men on the panel as well because I think uh, women and energy is is too important an issue to be left only for women to be speaking about. So. Um, Delighted to have uh, Venkat join us. Um, the World Bank has a, uh, a large um, gender and energy program in Africa that, that Venkat will be talking a little bit more about uh, as we move forward. Um, on my right, uh, Paula Jackson, who is the CEO of the American Association of Blacks in Energy. And um, Paula also has a very distinguished career um, working in the energy industry in a number of different uh, areas. Um, and in particular, uh, through her association, they're engaging through their membership with a whole range of um, energy uh, companies um, in different parts of Africa. And again, she'll be talking a little bit more about their experience, um, in particular, working with her counterparts in, in South Africa and other countries. And um, uh, on my right is um, Bob Healy, who is the, uh, Robert Healy Jr., I should say, who is a um, the head of the Healy International Re Relief Foundation, um, who is an entrepreneur, um, has been a very successful businessman with his family business. Um, and if you need to, or thinking about taking a vacation because the weather is so bad and you're thinking about maybe taking a cruise, um, Bob is, Bob is uh, <laughs> wincing at that, but uh, um, uh, his, uh, his, his, uh, his business is one certainly to consider if you're thinking of that uh, with the weather so bad. Um, but on his uh, philanthropic side, um, he leads the Healy International Relief Foundation, which is doing a, a, a tremendous amount of work um, now, particularly looking at, at healthcare settings and something very close to my own heart, which is looking at the way that you can helping, help to bring um, more sustainable and secure energy access into healthcare settings as a way to deliver better um, maternal and, and, and child and community health outcomes. So again, delighted that, uh, that Bob could um, join us this morning. And just a note that to say that we, we did originally have a, a representative from, from Power Africa um, as part of this panel this morning as well, and unfortunately he's uh, sick in bed with the flu, so was unable to join us. Um, but uh, um, some of us who know Power Africa, I think we can, we can perhaps talk about some of the elements that we see going on there as well. So I'd like to kick off um, with, with each of you in turn, just giving a few um, introductory comments about uh, your pro program, introducing your perspective. Um, and then from that, we will go into a, 
uh, broader conversation. Um, and also, as you're listening in the audience, uh, we want to have plenty of time for questions and input from, uh, from the audience as well. So, um, Venkat, maybe you could kick us off. Thank you very much, uh, Rishenda. Uh, good morning to all of you. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for this meeting and uh, Rishenda for the invitation. Uh, and, uh, but uh, most of all, thanks to all of you who braved the weather to be here. That shows uh, real commitment. And a real commitment is what we need if we really want to make a difference in you know, the gender equality. Because for too long, of course, people are aware of gender issues, everybody talks about them, but most of the time we end up just paying you know, lip service to that or at a project level or a program level, you simply check a box. Uh, so we need to make sure that that commitment actually you know, seeps into you know, making a real difference on the ground. And uh, I'm glad to say that at the World Bank, we moved on quite a lot from simply checking boxes to trying to do actual work. And uh, we have now been doing uh, you know, work uh, in the gender and energy for a long time. But now at the World Bank group, including IFC and other uh, organs that we have, uh, we actually have a corporate policy of um, having to put everything through the lens of gender, uh, all the projects, programs, grants, trust fund activities that we do. Uh, and I think that's a tremendous uh, you know, change uh, if you compare it with, say, five years back in terms of what we were doing and so on. Um, in the energy sector, for a very long time, uh, the activities around gender actually focused on energy access, per se, uh, and also largely in the household energy sector. Uh, so it's the issue of basically looking at the impacts of uh, energy access or the lack of access on the women's uh, lives and the lack of participation on the part of women in the energy programs uh, and also the lack of decision-making power um, of women in uh, you know, making choices at the household level. So these are some of the issues that I've been grappling with. Uh, and uh, we actually have a number of programs in terms of uh, energy access and uh, uh, you know, gender. But also now we have kind of expanded the scope of our gender activity to all the aspects of um, you know, energy sector as a whole. So whether it is uh, utility management or you know, generation transmission um, or various other aspects of uh, um, energy. Um, and there are, I think, two issues here. One is to see you know, what kind of impact that energy systems or energy access as women, but also, the flip side of it, you know, what can, uh, you know, an enhanced role for women in the, you know, management of energy projects or programs can actually have an impact on the energy sector. And, and very often, I think we end up simply looking at the first thing and say that, oh, we need to have, make sure that the energy projects would benefit women and so on. But I think now the discourse on gender and energy is now also moving towards, you know, uh, saying that you know we need to have an enhanced role for you know both genders uh, in an appropriate way, uh, so that you know we have uh, an efficient management of projects, efficient uh, you know m uh, achievement of results, and so on. And uh, I think that is what we are you know really uh, moving to. Um, and of course, uh, uh, Rishanda has made a mention of um, sustainable energy for all, and where. You know, energy access is one of the goals, and the goal is to achieve universal energy access for all by 2030, uh, which means providing access to electricity for 1.2 billion people across the world, uh, developing world, and uh, about 2.8 billion people uh, providing you know, clean cooking access, because you know, that's uh, one of the major issues related to gender, because most, uh, you know, People, especially in Africa, South Asia, and so on, still use traditional biomass uh, and biomass methods and technologies for cooking, which has huge impact on the health and you know various other uh, issues related to development and poverty. Um, so let me uh, stop there, but let me just make one last point uh, that uh, you know before we take up the discussion again, 
which is, you know, when I first started my career, uh, the very first research paper I actually wrote was about 25 years back, was on gender and energy. And we are basically, you know, at that time we were talking about, you know, how much time, you know, women spend in collecting fuel and, you know, how much time they have to spend in cooking, you know, that kind of thing. And even after 25 years, in many countries, we still talk about the same issues. So in that sense, in a way, you know, while we have made some progress in terms of awareness and, you know, uh, uh, even some programmatic uh, things, but we are still talking about some of the basic problems which still not have been completely addressed. Uh, and I think with the advent of sustainable energy for all and all these things, the time probably has also come to see how we can accelerate this gender mainstreaming process so that everybody can actually, you know, benefit from whatever uh, access that we are trying to create. So let me stop at that and then maybe we can take up this discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Venkat, for, for those remarks. Um, turning to you, Paula, now. Um, so what do women bring to the table in the energy sector? What's our unique strategic advantage? What, in your experience, is, is, uh, are the benefits that, that you can provide uh, working through your membership uh, in this area, and particularly as it relates to, to what's going on in uh, the transformation of in, in infrastructure in Africa right now? Okay. Well, that, that's a big question, so <laughs> thank you. Um, first, thank you for having me here. It's really such a pleasure, and thank you to Dr. Jones. And, um, you know, for me, it's really, really, really nice to be here because oftentimes when I speak at conferences around energy, there are not this many women in the room, to be frank. Um, and so to see so many women in the room and so many women of, the, of color is, a really, really big deal, um, as Dr. Jones will attest, that's extremely rare. Um, but I think, you know, if, if I were to talk about what's going to go on in Africa in terms of an emerging economy, some things I'd like for you to think about and to leave you with, um, when we talk about oftentimes sustainability, we're talking about sustainability of resources um, and how you produce the power that people need. But I would suggest that sustainability also means how do you ensure that the people who are there, who are going to receive that resource, that energy, that power, are able to then have some economic vitality around that. Um, and so how do you ensure that they have the technical capabilities to work in the industry that we're trying to create for them? Um, how do we ensure that the energy sector in Africa does not look like the energy sector in the U.S., which quite frankly is only 13% female? Um, so we don't want to replicate that when we have an opportunity to do something new and different there. And it's, it's very easy to transfer the skills and expertise that we have and the models that we have in the U.S. someplace else. But what I would suggest is that when we look about developing a sustainable energy economy in Africa and we start talking about distribu distributed generation and microgrids, um, we don't want to use a U.S. model because that's not what we have in the U.S. And we're struggling here in how do we transfer um, our existing energy infrastructure to something that would support more renewable resources, to something that would um, support microgrids. And so we, you know, when you start thinking about things like regulatory framework and the like, what you don't want to do is say, well, you need to do it the way we do it in the U.S. Because the way we do it in the U.S. is not going to give you the outcome that you're looking for there. Um, it's, it's not giving us the outcome that we're looking for here in terms of change. Um, and so I think that's important. As, as, as an association, just a little bit, you know, so we're a professional association, which means that my 1,600 members all work in the energy sector, from Wellhead to Berman or Tip, in all areas of management. Um, they could be meter readers, they're CEOs. Um, our commonality is that 99%, 98% of us are African American. 100% um, of us are interested in making sure that um, we are well represented in this industry, here and obviously abroad. Um, and so in, in my experience, particularly in South Africa, there are two things that have struck me as quite strange, but really very interesting. Um, the first time I was in, first, I, first time I was in Morocco and South Africa, um, I stood out because I was female and worked in this sector. And it did not matter who I met. They often asked me, they were very surprised. They were like, wow, you work in the energy industry. Have you always, and I'd say, oh, you know, I've been in the industry 20 years. And they were like, really? Um, and so that was a surprise. And that went from ministers to people at the African Development Bank to, you know, just anybody who's trying to get in the sector. 
Um, but more recently, what you're seeing, particularly in South Africa, is lots of young ladies who are going to school to learn how to do solar installation, to, ha to learn how to do these kinds of projects that don't have mentors. And so I was there in October to speak at a policymaker conference, and there were a lot of academics in the room. And the one thing that they wanted to make sure that I did was get on campus to meet these young ladies. Because what they realize is that oftentimes these women um, you know, may be the first to go to school, may be the first to have that kind of opportunity, and there isn't a base of women there that can be mentors and supportive of them. And so while we don't have that large of a base here, we as an association feel, <clears throat> extremely, feel that it's extremely important that that's a role that we can very easily play is being mentors to young women and quite frankly to Africans and African Americans who are interested in getting into this business. Um, and finally, I would say, you know, when we talk about um, energy and access for women, I, I hope that we also talk about the economics around that. Um, one of the things that I've noticed when, when I'm in conferences here at the U.S. and we talk about climate change and women, we talk about health, but we don't talk about small business opportunity. And I think that's a shame because that's really where the real power is. We absolutely agree, I think, no one would say that we shouldn't all have clean air to breathe and clean water to drink and, and good health. But if we don't focus on how do you ensure that female-owned businesses or minority-owned businesses um, are part of that economic engine, then I think we're doing a huge dis disservice because in my view, that's really what's sustainable. That's really the most important part about sustainability is how do you have that longevity so that there's an economic vitality in those organizations in those countries. I hope I answered your question. Great, thanks so much, uh, uh, Paula. Very rich uh, set of um, comments and insights there that I think we can pick up uh, in the discussion going forward. But let me turn first to Bob. Um, and, and Bob, I, I know that you're doing a lot of work on the ground in Sierra Leone. So can you unpack that a little bit further for us in terms of how you are um, looking at uh, gender issues in the context of your work with, with hospitals and energy access there? Certainly. Well, first off, thank you all for, for braving the weather. Uh, Rashenda's right in the, the other half of what I do. Uh, if you want to go to Miami or Florida and get on a boat, uh, <laughs> I know a guy, so I can help you out. Um, but I have to tell you that I, I wouldn't rather be anywhere than here today because while, uh, while we have a lot of other businesses in my family, this has never worked for me. Uh, I enjoy this greatly. Um, <clears throat> so we, the Healy International Relief Foundation has primarily been in Sierra Leone, Africa for roughly the last 10 to 12 years, right towards the end of the Civil War, if any of you are familiar with that portion of West Africa. Um, by and large, what we found is that uh, although the entire population certainly suffered, the uh, greatest piece of that population that suffered is women. There's no question about that. Um, you know, as, as has been illustrated by my other panelists and, and by Roshenda, women uh, bear the brunt of the, uh, of the labor around the household, particularly in rural areas. Um, women are delivering in childbirth. And in a country like Sierra Leone, um, that's oftentimes a death sentence. Sierra Leone had the highest infant mortality rate in the world for many, many years. Um, I think it's finally been, I think it's finally on its way up, but um, it has one of the highest children under five mortality rates in the world. Um, it has one of the highest pregnant mother death rates in the world as well. Um, and a good portion of that has to do not only with uh, no, zero access to energy when you get into the rural areas, but also very small access to education. Um, you have untrained midwives who are delivering babies um, who have no, almost no idea what they're doing. Um, and <clears throat> a big piece of that uh, education, a big part of that education that's missing has to do with energy access, quite frankly. And I'll share you a story that might illustrate this. And you'll have to excuse me because in a, being in a family business um, and being in uh, so country specific in what we do, we tend to take a really long-term view uh, in our programs and what we try to achieve. Because uh, my, my joke with people is they'll, people will say, well, when are you gonna go to another country? And I say, well, when we fix all the problems in Sierra Leone, then we'll move on to another country. So we'll be there probably until I'm old and gray, hopefully. Um, there's a village uh, up in the north of Sierra Leone called Kitcham. It's one of the poorest villages, uh, chiefdoms rather, in the country. 
Uh, a few years ago, um, Kitchum installed a, uh, or well, many, many years ago, the now uh, deceased chief of Kitchum, uh, his big thing was education. He felt that every child ought to be educated. No child in this chiefdom should lack for an education, whether they were male or female, which was a very radical thought in the uh, 70s and early 80s. And so he insisted that all of the children of the village be sent to school. He built many, many schools around the chiefdom. Um, he forced some parents to send their children to school to be educated. Um, and so these children were. Uh, their test scores were extremely low. Everybody relegated that to the fact that it's the poorest part of the country and, you know, these are country bumpkins and you're not going to be able to educate them even if you pump a lot of money into building schools. Well, I can tell you that a few years ago uh, they installed a solar array on a library in the main village in Kitchen, and suddenly all the test scores went up. Now, why is that? Three extra hours of studying time. That's it. Kids could study at night. All the test scores went up. Many of those schools in Kitchen are now at the top of the list of, uh, of, of the, of the uh, school list as far as grades are concerned. The reason I tell you that story is because we take a downstream look at this stuff. How many of those children, particularly young girls in a rural area, will get edu will, with, with that extra three hours of education because of the benefits of having access to energy will now go on to instead of being uh, living out their lives the way their parents did, may now go on to Freetown, to the university there, or perhaps to another university in Africa, or maybe even in London and, or the US. So I would challenge you not only to think about the uh, access to, uh, for women in the energy field, which is extremely, extremely important because by and large, uh, as Paul illustrated, there's a lot of small business opportunities there. There's a lot of sustainability, but also make sure that women don't miss out on the benefits of what that energy then provides. All of those secondary benefits, which are absolutely massive and stunning, even on a very small scale, uh, particularly when you're dealing with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Thanks, Bob. Um, that, that's, a great, that's a great point to sort of throw the discussion open a little bit more because um, sort of looking back to the work that we're doing, um, we've talked a little bit about the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, which is an initiative of the United Nations and the World Bank uh, Secretary General and, and President. Um, and if you're not aware, the, the UN has actually declared um, 2014 to 2024 the decade of sustainable energy for all. Um, and one of the three areas and goals within that is this focus on universal energy access, the other two being uh, um, Im improvements in energy efficiency and, and doubling the global um, use of, of renewable energy as well. But beyond that, at the UN right now, there's a lot of discussion around um, what happens next after the Millennium Development Goal uh, process is concluded um, uh, in 2015 and sort of what should replace them. And so there's a lot of discussion around sustainable development goals and particularly um, looking at some of these, what we call nexus issues. So I, I suppose to, to, to put it easily, you know, everything is related to everything else. So um, Bob's point about the fact that energy access has um, incredible benefits beyond the actual provision of the electrons to, to that school uh, in terms of future educational outcomes for those children, I think is a, is a, is a key point in this. Um, and so one of the areas that we're looking at, in fact, is treating it as a, as a, a sort of a nexus issue, which is um, potentially as, a, as its own sustainable development goal, but recognizing that it has an imp impact on income, um, on opportunities for small businesses, on, on health and education um, and other areas as well. So turning back to, to, to all of you now, I mean, I think it would be really good just to talk a little bit more about um, some tangible areas where you see uh, opportunities for um, ensuring that we can not only sort of by default have a benefit for women, but how can we in our programs, and perhaps Benkat, you can, you can pick up some examples from your work in Mali and, and Kenya and Tanzania. How can we be sort of trying to get the most bang for our buck, whether it's from a private for-profit side or whether it's from a um, institutional investor side, to, to get as many of these benefits as possible 
um, for women? You know, is it the education piece? Where, where should we be moving for this work? Okay, thank you. I think the, you know, first of all, the gender mainstreaming in the energy sector is not going to happen by default. I think we will have to make it happen, you know, at least for the foreseeable future. I think that is the, you know, first point. So we need to consciously, you know, uh, incorporate the elements of gender mainstreaming into any project design or program design that you, you know, take up. I think that's, uh, you know, very, very critical. Um, to give an example, you know, we have been doing the rural energy access program in Mali, in West Africa, you know, for a long time, though it's now on hold because of all the political turmoil that happened in the last year or and a half or so. Uh, where the major focus, of course, is on extending access through grid electricity, uh, but also it had components of off-grid uh, through solar um, and also clean cook stoves for cooking, you know, and so on. Um, and one of the things that we, you know, have been working with the Rural Energy Agency, which is the focal counter, you know, point for us, um, is to see how we can actually introduce the elements of gender mainstreaming into that. And one of the initial things that we did was actually to uh, work with, you know, two, three women who are part of this program from the government side and sensitize them, you know, about uh, the whole gender issues and so on and uh, then see how, you know, we can reflect that in the project design at the grassroots level. Uh, and after a year of that kind of activity, you know, one of the uh, things that happened was that the Rural Energy Agency actually decided to employ one of those three women as a gender specialist, you know, to all the rural energy programs that they're doing which, you know, in our view at that time was a tremendous achievement, you know, the clear recognition that there is a role for somebody like that to play in a project implementation, I think is a huge advancement, you know, as far as uh, their mindset is concerned. So that's a very, you know, concrete example of, uh, um, you know, how we could actually make that, you know, difference. But there are, you know, many, many examples. In fact, I have a, you know, list here, you know, the LPG program in Indonesia you know, which is uh, touted as a very successful, you know, program, has, uh, you know, uh, documented evidence in terms of the difference that it made to women. And then we have, uh, you know, uh, the urban South Africa has some examples. We have uh, Mali, I already mentioned. Um, and also in terms of the entrepreneurship, you know, providing you know, electricity access to, you know, women uh, entrepreneurs, you know, has improved incomes in Janjibar, you know, uh, um, in Tanzania. So there are a number of, uh, you know, examples that are out there. But the thing is, they still tend to be small, somewhat isolated examples of success. Um, and they're still at a pilot scale and all. So the challenge really is, how do you really take this whole thing to scale? So that is really the challenge. And as we are now under Sustainable Energy for All, talking about in the next 15 years providing you know, energy access to 1.2 billion people, you know, you're really talking about scale, right? I mean, uh, so when you basically do that kind of scale up, how can you actually ensure that the man gender mainstreaming is an integral part of that is one of the challenges that we, you know, going forward, we need to, you know, tackle. You know, I would, I would say that probably the first step would be to make sure that you include them from the very beginning. Um, you know, we heard two stories today that I think are really quite telling. So we start out hearing about a story about children not going to school and the way to get them there is, is to provide them breakfast. And the only way you know that is that someone actually went and asked them, how come you're not sending your kids to school? Um, and then we hear another story about students not doing well on tests and then you discover, well, all you needed was a light bulb. And so the hardest thing to do really is to include people from the very beginning. And so if you're trying to respond to the needs of women and make them a part of this process, that means you have to have them there when you start thinking about whatever it is that you're trying to develop and find out what their immediate needs are. And I would suggest you look for the, the low-hanging fruit, right? Because that's how you get the buy-in. So if the simple thing is, look, I just need some electricity five hours a day to do X 
and we're able to accomplish that very easily and simply, then it's really easier to then keep them engaged as you try to build this out and move forward. Um, but I, but I, I won't suggest to you that that's an easy thing to do because I don't think it is. People, we all know, we all have multiple things that are our priorities in our day-to-day -day lives and how difficult it is to engage people on something that I may think is important but may not be at the top 10 of their list. But if you make the effort to, make, to include them, um, I think then the rewards you'll see way far beyond what you could have possibly imagined. Um, you know, just thinking when you talk about inclusion and, and scale, um, you know, I, I would say you've got to look not only uh, to those two things, but you have to look to, um, well, I, I can give you a, a specific case, frankly, banking. And the reason I tell you that is, um, you know, in Sierra Leone, we're very blessed that they have a, a gender affairs office within the government that is very, very active. Um, I, I, know the, I know the head of it very well, and she's extremely fierce, <laughs> very fierce woman. Um, she, and so they've been very, very, for, the country's been very fortunate in providing um, forums for women, owned, uh, women business owners to get together and share ideas. Uh, I was very blessed to be able to be uh, president at one of those forums. And ca almost categorically, um, the first thing I got told when I said, well, okay, what's your, what's your biggest need here? What's your biggest problem is banking. And there were many women owned business. There were a couple who were solar installers, you know, I mean, just as an example. Um, if you are a single woman in Africa, uh, at least in Sierra Leone, good luck getting a loan. I mean, minus a micro loan, but these are women who have taken that micro loan and built their business. And it's a small business, but it, uh, they're profitable. And they, the only way they can go in and get a loan of any, with any reasonable interest rate or any size of money whatsoever is their husband either has to come, and he's the signer, or, God forbid, you're a single mother or you're a single woman, um, you, will, you can get a loan, but I guarantee you it's not at an interest rate that you can do business on. So I think some attention has to be paid, and I don't present to you any easy, quick, silver bullet fix to that, but some attention has to be paid to access to capital uh, for women business owners, to be able to expand and grow their business. That's the only way you attack scale on that end, in my opinion. Thanks very much for Bob on that. And for those of you who might be tweeting, I think that's eminently tweetable because this is something that we hear time and time and time again from women around the world, which is, make it easier, we want to grow our businesses. We, we even talk about the sort of the missing middle of access to capital for the SMEs. We've got it as far as microfinance is concerned, but there's still so much more that can be done in helping women even get beyond that, that, that doorstep of access to capital, whether it's through the bank or um, through other arrangements to be able to grow their businesses. You know, women are great at running micro enterprises, but they don't have to stop there. Um, and they want to grow their businesses. And, and that's something that we, we hear you know, from many different parts of the world, which is it's just still way more of a struggle than it needs to be. So hopefully somebody can put that into 140 characters or less. <laughs> so, so coming back to this, Paula, you, you had talked um, also about sort of some of the ways that you mentioned about the girls getting the education. And we've heard in, in, in my work, you know, we, we know that some of the best solar technicians out there in Ethiopia and Uganda are women. And we hear that they've, they've, they've had to struggle to be accepted initially, um, but when they're on the job, and they, they're actually more dedicated oftentimes, um, they're more eager to learn, and they're really, really um, persistent. So how do you think structurally, you know, do we have to wait a generation until the girls that are being educated now can sort of help to take over? Or how, how do you think we can, we can address this in a way that we can make an impact today as well as tomorrow? And I'm sorry, that wasn't the questions that we had on the cheat sheet no, before okay. we started, so I'm, I'm throwing her a little bit of a curveball. That, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a tough question. Um, I, you know, if I had a simple answer, I think the, the energy industry in the U.S. would look a lot different, and it doesn't. Um, you know, I, I, I would say that part of this is time. I would not suggest waiting a generation. I don't think you have a generation to wait. Um, you know, the world is changing, and there are going to be more young women, young girls who are going to be getting into industries across the world, um, and particularly in Africa. But I think that we need to um, 
particularly as Americans who are either investing in projects or who have influence um, over those investments in those projects, you know, you can exercise that influence in a myriad of ways. And one way is to ask the question, so what are you doing if I'm going to invest in whatever it is here um, to make sure that women are a part of that project or a part of that workforce or trained or educated, et cetera? Um, and you really just have to ask the question. It's not even really that you have to make a demand because typically asking the question is enough of a hint for somebody to kind of get that they've got to do something. Um, but I think for us a lot of times it's a hard question to ask. And, and I would suggest um, that this is very similar to when we talk about here about diversity in our workplaces. It's not until someone actually brings it up that people start to think about it. Um, and yet sometimes we're afraid to bring it up. And, and I think that that's a problem. I mean, you know it's not diverse. You know, in, in my professional career, and, and this is an example, I worked at a company, and at one point we were hiring, and I would always hear, you know, we don't have African American engineers because we can't find them. And so I would say, okay, so if I find some, you'll consider hiring them. And it was kind of like, okay, yeah, we would absolutely do that. But it took me to actually mention it because it just wasn't on anybody's radar screen. And so I think we have an obligation to at least put it on somebody's radar screen to say, so what is it that you're going to be doing to be ensuring that you have more women as part of this workforce, to ensure that um, you have a work, a work environment that is gonna be welcoming? But I think the other piece for us is that it requires, and this I think speaks to some about the banking capital, is it requires some creative thinking. Everything can't happen and be done the way we do it here. All right, we, if we're investing and going somewhere else, we need to have some cultural sensitivities about the way people in that particular environment, how they do their work, how they spend their days, how they think about their time and work-life balance and all those kinds of things. Um, and, and, and in that, I think then you'd be able to get people to think about how am I gonna be more inclusive. But if we're trying to take the model that we use here and dump it somewhere else because it works well for us, I, I think that you fail at that. I don't think that works very, very well. Um, and so I think we need to be very creative in terms of how are we going to um, bring more people in um, and particularly get more women involved, but we're also gonna have to give signals that that's important to us um, so that someone understands that that's one of your priorities. Great. Do either of you want to take that on? Yeah, let me make a small you know, comment here. Um, I mean, talking about diversity, uh, yes, I mean, having more women um, in workplaces is definitely a start. But I think it's not simply a question of numbers. Uh, it's also an issue of, you know, mindset. Uh, you know, here, of course, in an urbanized setting, in a developed world setting, you know, we probably take some of the gender um, mainstreaming issues for granted. But, you know, in the last one month, the most profound gender statement I had was from an ex-Congresswoman who said that American public is not ready for a woman American president. So I said, oh, okay, so we need to make some progress here as well, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's not simply there's some remote area in Africa that we are talking about. So there are two parts to this challenge, you know, in terms of, okay, we do these numbers, we, you know, help women access to finance, you know, improve their businesses, that's one part of it. But there's other part which is to, you know, work on the you know, cultural mindset, which is a centuries old process. Um, because, you know, one proposition that I always make in this thing is, you, know, you can't simply claim that you are mainstreamed in gender while you are not, you know, independent in any way in any other aspect or any other sphere in the society that you are working on. So, you know, the energy mainstreaming cannot be independent of, you know, everything else that happens in the society. So, in that sense, you, of course, we, you know, make a lot of efforts in the energy sector to gender mainstream and so on. But the progress you can make if you really don't work on the other, you know, parts of the society is only going to be marginal. You know, that, so that is where it's very important to have this integrated approach where the education, the health, the, you know, all the other, you know, sectors that have uh, linkages to this and the nexus that uh, Rishinda is talking about, you know, is extremely critical. Because we simply cannot say that, okay, from the energy sector perspective, we are doing what we can do and then we leave at it, then you know, it's a very, very slow burning, you know, slow progress that we can make. 
So let's, let's come back again for a moment to the sort of the, the nuts and bolts of, of energy access again, recognizing that not, not everybody in, in, uh, in the audience may be so sort of familiar with the technical issues. Maybe we could just spend a few minutes um, and then we'll throw it open for, for questions to um, come back and sort of walk, walk us through what are, what are we talking about um, when we're talking about access to energy and, and women's involvement particularly let's say, as, as a beneficiary or the customer if they're purchasing the service, what, what specifically are we, are we talking about? Are we talking about the design of a small-scale solar solution that meets women's needs? Are we talking about powering the appliances that they're working with? How, how are we looking at this sort of in a tangible, practical way? Um, I know Bob um, can talk a little bit about some of the healthcare settings and specifically um, how you know we talk about saving women's lives, um, but specifically, what kind of interventions are, are we looking at when we're when we're really sort of coming back to let, let's walk it through at the level of the woman, um, whether it's in her community or in her household. Uh, what what are the solutions that we're we're talking about? Well, if you, um, I mean, if you want, if to break it down at a very basic level, if you're talking about a woman, let's say who's about to give birth, then there's I mean, energy pervades the entire process, and, and access to energy makes is, is normally a life or death thing. thing. So, um, by and large, the nearest clinic or hospital is extremely far away. So that's one form of energy. It may not be renewable. You're talking about gasoline or diesel, but she's got to be able to get there, and she can't walk by and large. So, um, you're talking about having um, access to uh, uh, vehicles for women. Or, or at least uh, some sort of uh, ambulance system, which doesn't exist right now. Um, <clears throat> you then talk, once you get somebody to a hospital to treat them, whether it's for pregnancy or something else, talk of keeping the pregnancy vein, um, then you're talking about having to uh, do all of the workup and tests to find out where they are, how far along they are, how's their health, what's their background. Um, by and large, those records don't exist. I mean, you're talking about having a computer system that requires a lot of energy. And frankly, when you look at a hospital, a computer is about the last thing a doctor or nurse in a third world country is going to tell you they need or want there. They want an, maybe an x-ray machine. Uh, they absolutely need uh, machines to sterilize uh, all of their instruments because that goes back to sustainability because you can't throw everything out. You've got to reuse everything that you can. Um, you know, in a lot of the clinics that we saw by some very high-end organizations that are out there doing a lot of good work, um, their sterilization techniques a, furn a brick furnace, um, which does work, but it's not optimal, I can tell you that much. Um, you know, once you've, uh, once you've actually delivered, you've got a recovery period. If there's any sort of complications, um, you're talking about uh, massive needs for... Uh, uh, everything from uh, just basic electricity to, uh, you know, uh, being able to run out from whatever clinic or hospital you are to get whatever medications are needed back to there in a timely manner. Um, and, you know, keep in mind, every minute that you deal with a pregnancy complication, that woman or that child gets that much closer to not making it. Um, so time is extremely of the essence, and being able to have a rapid response to all these things is extremely important. All that requires energy whether it's uh, being able to power up a cell phone to make a call or whether it's being able to get in the car and uh, head down the road or whatever that is. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, on our end, uh, we deal a lot, uh, the, our foundation, particularly in, in uh, several of the hospitals we deal with, deals a lot with generators. It's not sustainable, it's not optimal, but it's what you have. Um, you know, you've got uh, some hospitals uh, that are starting to put in solar arrays. Um, it's expensive. It's a lot more expensive than it is here, by and large. Um, you know, and then you have the issue with what happens if it breaks? How do you keep it repaired? You know, I can find you a diesel, I can find you a guy to repair a diesel generator in Sierra Leone. It's much, much harder to find you a man, woman, or woman to repair a solar array and to get them out there in a timely manner. Um, so uh, that's, I mean, that's pretty much how energy pervades that sort of a process when it comes to healthcare. 
Um, I, I mean, I think I would say that, you know, in, in every step of the process, there's probably an impact to women. Um, so, you know, access to electricity is really not gender specific, obviously. Everybody, you know, the, the real thing is that everybody needs to have it. Um, but there's so many different things that are going on when you talk about access to, to power in a place where there is no power. So you're talking about building a grid. You're talking about what is the regulatory structure of that grid. You're talking about serving a customer base who may or may not have the ability to pay. Um, and, and, and so how do you, one, make sure that whoever's providing that service is profitable? If, if that's, you know, if it's a private, privately owned entity. Um, it's about making sure that that power is reliable so that you're not having rolling blackouts. And if you do, people kind of know if it's from two to five, I'm not gonna have power. I know that, not that just, you know, one day it goes dark and I have no idea when it is or is not going to come on. Um, it's about education um, and so one, the education that people can get because they have access to electricity, but it is also about giving people education so that they can work in what is an emerging in industry. And it may be building a solar array, developing, um, installing a solar array, but it's also about grid management. It's about accounting and business. I mean, there are so many things that are kind of weaved into this industry that you've got to think about and that I think women can play a role it's about how do you include small businesses and how, how do you look at capitalizing small businesses. Um, it's about how do you, um, quite frankly, make sure that African resources are used for Africans. Um, you know, all of that stuff, I think, is, is really are issues that you've got to start to think about. Um, it's, it, it is about sustainable resources, but quite frankly, it's about natural gas. And I think, you know, we've got to talk about base load, and so how are you going to ensure that even in places where you have microgrids, whether it's solar or wind, there's, a, there's some sort of backup source. Is it diesel, is it gas, is it hydro, what, what is that? And if, it's, and if they're using water to develop power, let's think about then all the other things that we need water for, and so that we're not having water constraints because we're using it for one particular thing and taking away from something else. And let's, you know, and understand that some of these um, uh, uh, generating factors need water anyway. And so it's all that kind of balanced stuff in terms of just the industry grid development that we have to be very, very clear on um, and all of the things that feed into that. So it, to me, it's about understanding what is the supply chain and the procurement process. And you know, um, it's great to be able to develop the solar array, and I could be the solar array developer, but it might be better to be the person who builds the solar panel, right? Or build the bolt that puts that solar panel, you know, the photovoltaic and thing. So, you know, you gotta understand what that supply chain is so that there are all these kinds of opportunities that we are laying out for people to be able to take advantage of, but then how do you educate them? How do you make sure that they are um, aligned, involved, interested, prepared, um, and so on and so forth. And then, at least for us as an association, our job is to figure out how do we support that effort, right? My job is not to do it. My job is to figure out how do I help you be successful so that you can do it, so that when we go back to whatever it is that we do, that's still running and you, you have that kind of um, opportunity and economic viability. Thank you. Um, you know, there was a mention of the solar repair. You know, one of the powerful examples of what actually women can do is the Barefoot College in uh, India, where, you know, a number of, um, in fact, thousands of illiterate, semi-illiterate women actually were trained in the solar uh, assembly and uh, repair, and many of them actually have you know, gone on to become entrepreneurs, and now uh, the, you know, activity has also spread to Africa and many other, you know, uh, um, regions. So that's a very good example of actually what you know can be done. But again, you know, you need a huge multiplier there. You know, it's you know we need several more thousands of such you know uh, examples uh, to really make a, you know difference. Uh, I think both the panelists here actually have spoken about the access at a kind of a micro level. So I, I, just to kind of unpack it at a slightly you know broader level, 
when we are actually talking about access, we are talking about broadly four things, you know. We are talking about access to electricity, because electricity is a versatile you know, source that can do a number of things. Um, and then we have the access to clean cooking. You know, basically, now mostly people use what we call solid fuels, biomass, coal, charcoal, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so how can we basically move them towards more, you know, LPG, electricity, you know, and those things. Um, then we have what we call the productive applications. You know, we have um, two categories there. We have economically productive applications. So how do you ensure access of energy to, say, agriculture, small-scale industries, or cottage industries, you know, so things like that. Uh, and then you have the socially productive, you know, applications, uh, whether it is energy access to community health centers or, you know, community centers you know, for people to get together or schools, you know, some of those things. So these are the broad, you know, uh, macro categories that we talk about when we, you know, talk about expanding energy access. And within that, of course, you know, as Paula mentioned in electricity, you have grid electricity, you have off-grid, and now mini-grids are actually becoming quite popular you know, across Africa, for example. Um, and uh, then in the issue, in you know, a case of clean cooking, you have a number of options. You know, even biomass itself, now you have improved advanced stoves that actually take care of some of the health issues that uh, we have talked about. Uh, then we have uh, LPG, we have, uh, you know, electricity-based uh, gadgets, you know, a number of things. In fact, if uh, some of you have followed uh, Kirk Smith, who is a, you know, well-known expert in the health and energy, you know, one of his recent uh, formulations is that he's now recommending that if you really want to address the health issue, which is, in the case of biomass, is four million deaths every year, premature deaths every year, um, due to exposures to indoor and outdoor, outdoor air pollution. Uh, so he's basically advocating now uh, to move towards electricity where you have reasonable supply. Of course, the problem is in most countries you don't have reasonable supply in the rural areas. But that is where if you can, for example, combine off-grid electricity solutions and then move the cooking to you know, electricity, that's perhaps the best case scenario in terms of addressing the health impacts you know, for women. So that's, you know, so this is the kind of, you know, uh, uh, formulation we also have under sustainable energy for all, where at the country level right now we are engaged in developing what we call investment prospectuses, you know, in terms of increasing access. So this prospect is essentially would come up with a number of investable projects, programs, and activities uh, that if all, you know, if they found the finance required and they are, are implemented, would actually help the country reach the universal energy access goal, you know, by 2030. Um, so, uh, so in this process, again, you know, all these categories that I have mentioned, you know, obviously there is a you know, strong role for, you know, gender mainstreaming and uh, creating, you know, appropriate roles. You know, for a, and also let me add here that when we talk about, you know, gender mainstreaming, we also, of course, always equate it with basically increasing the role for women. And given the, you know, relatively, uh, the relative roles women have in the societies, that's very appropriate. But in the context of the energy project itself, you know, the way we see it is that you need to basically have a, what we call appropriate roles for both the genders, you know, in terms of managing, designing, managing, implementing, you know, those programs to basically maximize the, you know, impacts. Um, so, uh, that's, you know, very important. So in each of these categories, we could actually look at specific roles for women and men and, you know, and so on. And then we basically need to make sure that is reflected in the, you know, design of whatever programs that we do. Great. Thanks, everybody. So in the few remaining uh, minutes, I want to turn it over to you now um, for any questions or comments. And in the interest of time, if you could just say your name, your organization, if, if that's relevant, and... Uh, um, keep your comments short. So we'll take we'll take three three questions. So start here in the middle. Is there there's a mic? So three quick questions and comments, um, and then uh, we'll turn back to the panelists. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm a president of two companies, a non-profit Kanban and a profit Kanban. And I want to thank CSI for this wonderful event. And the most person I want to thank is President Obama for the Power Initiative because I'm involved into the Power Initiative. And being involved is I'm an African woman born and raised in Africa. I'm from Kenya. 
I'm focusing on rural area ratification because rural area people have been ignored in Africa completely. They are the ones who are given the worst things. They can do electricity, stuff, and whatever. I'm advocating and I'm part of the pill on the hill. I'll share with you what I sent uh, uh, Congressman Eti Royce on the pill for um, Power Africa. Oh, what I wanted to comment was what he said about education. If African people now, Africa is developed using cell phones, if they can pay for their cell phones in the rural areas, they can pay for power. Looking at farmers, uh, women cooking with electricity, no stuff. We want actual power in the rural areas. We want actual power in the schools. We want actual power in the clinics, like he said. Using power in the rural areas, investors say, we can't invest in rural area because they are not going to pay for the, for the power. Those people can be educated. If they can use cell phones, they can use power and pay for power. So why can they be given really power instead of a stove or, in, um, or um, a generator to use? So how do we work with the President Obama initiative? I'm great. It has involved us as civil societies. And I'm so happy as an African woman, I'm involved. But coming to World Bank, I was the first, my company was the first company to write a missing middle concept. In our missing middle concept was about women, was about solar, was about energy, was about water. They said they could not give us money because we were a startup bank to support women. So I left that alone until I focus on my own company to help the women in Africa. How do we make this happen in the rural areas of Africa? It's all about education, people being educated. If we don't, and then we just say they are rural area, and that's why I'm part of the pill, I'm part of Obama Power Initiative, and I'm part of CSI now listening to you all. How do we make it happen in the rural area where I come from? Not a story, not a book, not a television. That's where I grew, and there is need in all African rural areas. How do we work together and make it happen, as he says, we just talk power for Africa, but how do we know what is happening on the ground? We went, the World Bank will get a researcher, stay in a big hotel, and then don't go to the rural area, finished my research. Everything is done. Power is done. No, this time I'm watching and I'm following. I'm part of it. We want the money and we want the rural areas to be supported. How do we do it together? Not only stories. Thank you. Thank you very much. A, a great challenge to all of us. Uh, uh, the lady at the back there. Thank you so much, panel, for your insight. I'm Courtney Vaughan, and um, my company is called Gulf Lady. We do have an energy sector. I actually wrote the five-year strategic business plan to institute the West Africa Electricity Power Pool on the World Bank on contract for 2006 and five years later. But nonetheless, and I've worked in over 40 countries, Many of them are African societies. Energy sector is just one of what we do. I'm an investment banker that got into development banking. And listening over the years to the various comments about Africa and energy and women, and even today, it seems as if there's a disconnect between what the rural state is and the modern state, especially when we speak about energy. Many of what Paul is talking about is mostly from the modern state, and rightfully so. You did say that one has to understand context on the ground, you know, in different countries where, for example, women are involved in energy, have always been involved in many African societies, even if they're just selling coal. That's a major micro, you know, sector where women are involved. It may not be American electricity power <laughs> where coal is at another level in terms of modernization, for example. Fuel, women are involved with fuel for transportation and diesel in a major way. So unless we start to really look at the realities on the ground and how to uplift it, I think there will be so much confusion about women in energy, whether they're engineers and things you know you have to invest in today for the future as the electricity sector evolves and modernizes, okay? So, um, and then in terms of investment, I do believe that again, a woman who has her little coal, you know, coal bags of coal selling in the market, she has made that investment. And I believe that is where World Bank also needs to pay more attention to bring some of the solutions. Thank you. Just talk lower. 
Good morning. I want to thank all of the panelists for speaking. My name is T.I.G. Salam Blyther. I come from Congressional Research Service. My job is to provide analysis uh, to members of Congress on a range of issues. I am a global health specialist, and usually when I'm in the room with energy people, they look at me like I'm weird, like, why are you here? Um, so I was glad to hear Bob's comment because absolutely energy is critical for the functioning of health systems as well as for things we don't think of in terms of refrigeration of uh, medicines and equipment. If those the medicines that are needed are not uh, properly managed at the right temperatures, they're useless and we donate medicines and don't think of these things. But I wanted to say thank you very much to Ms. Jackson for talking about not necessarily exporting our way of doing things. I think um, the lack of infrastructure is actually a wonderful for opportunity to leapfrog and uh, skip some of the mistakes that we've made, particularly in a messy business we don't like to talk about, which is extractable energies. So I would like to hear more from you about what your organization does to uh, work with policy reform with these governments to, to work towards sustainable energy, not just in piecemeal projects, which we love to do, pilot projects, but in terms of creating an enabling environment, a policy environment to have thoughtful, well thought out energy plans that could permeate all the sectors so it's not this piecemeal approach. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much to everybody for those questions and comments. And in the few mi minutes remaining, maybe we could start with Paula to begin to address those. And, um, um, put in those concluding remarks, but I would like to remind everybody we have the rest of the morning as well, so it's great to have uh, such a passionate and engaged audience, and I hope through, through the morning we'll be able to pick up on a number of these themes also in, in our other panels and, and over lunch as well. So um, as, you, as you hear, we women, we're, we're passionate about these issues. So. <laughs> Um, you know, very briefly, you know, what I will say is most recently um, when I was in South Africa, I did speak at a, a conference for policy uh, makers, and, and quite frankly, you could have written my comments. Um, so, you know, for us as an association, our role really is to inform and educate, not just policymakers here, but now we've expanded that. And, and, and the ideas that you've expressed are the very ideas that we, we start to talk about. But we also, um, when I talk about capacity building, we're also talking about capacity building for regulators, so that when you're beginning to, to develop a framework, you're keeping in mind the context in which you are in now um, and not trying to replicate something else, um, which is not to say that what we have here is not successful, because obviously it's very, very successful. It just means that it's not the only way to do it. Um, and so we start to talk to people about thinking through, you know, what is it that you have now? What is it that you want? And how can you create a framework that's going to work for your particular desires um, and not necessarily just replicate where you see something else? Well. Uh, first off, you don't look that strange to me, so um, now I feel a little more comfortable. Um, you know, you mentioned something um, I, I think that's very key, and that's extractables. I don't think you can ignore them. Um, they, for better or for worse, they're here. I, I think it's a horrible thing, personally, that, that we're, we continue to be on them to the degree that we are in the Western world and in other places, but you have to deal with them. Um, and you have to deal with their management, not just as it pertains to providing energy for wherever they're being extracted, but how they're managed as far as whether they're sold out of the country and how, where that money goes and whether that's well regulated. Um, you know, Sierra Leone has, pulled, has uh, found oil offshore a couple of years ago, and mark my words, over the next 20 years, how they manage that find whether that's coming into the country, whether it's being sold, and how that money's used, how they manage that's going to dictate uh, where they go. So you can't ignore it. You have to deal with it. Thank you for all the comments. Um, I particularly was struck by the last comment in terms of uh, the need for an enabling environment. You know, just to put this the whole thing in the context, you know, when we are talking about achieving uh, universal energy access, one of the key requirements there is huge amount of investment. You know, the estimation made by the International Energy Association is, uh, agency is we need about $50 billion every year till 2030 if you really have to achieve that particular goal. So we are actually talking about large, you know, amounts. And, uh, you know, that kind of 
resources is actually not going to come from public funding or development, you know, donors and so on. So there is also a need to leverage a huge amount of uh, private sector uh, capital into, you know, the sustainable energy sector, which is actually a huge challenge that the Sustainable Energy for All initiative is trying to, you know, tackle. Um, and also, if you want to attract private capital into sustainable energy projects, you know, we need an uh, enabling environment. You know, the private sector capital is not going to come into a country or a particular project if it is not going to make profits. So if you don't have the right kind of regulatory environment, right kind of policies, you know, they are not going to be interested. So one of the efforts, actually, that we are doing in the initial phases of sustainable energy for all is try and work with the governments and other stakeholders in these countries to create exactly that kind of you know, enabling environment. But within that, I would also say that within that framework, we also need to make more focused and specialized efforts to also make sure that enabling environment touches upon the gender you know, issues as well. So if you basically need to probably make special efforts to increase the business you know, opportunities for women or increase the access of capital to women, businesses, you know, and so on. So in that sense, we are, you know, especially in terms of scaling up, we are actually talking about a huge challenge and creating the right kind of, uh, you know, enabling environment at the country level, at the program level, is an important uh, component of that. Uh, just one more thing, you know, I actually have some pamphlets here on the World Bank's work on gender and energy. I'll leave them here, so for those who are interested, you could pick them up. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. And, and I also want to say that, that we have... Uh, um, about 1,600 energy entrepreneurs that we work with, and we'd love to see more women. Um, so personally, I'm going to be talking to Paula after this to figure out how we can be really um, looking at, at helping to, to bring more women into the sector. But please join me in thanking all of our panelists uh, this morning for an interesting panel. Thank you. Thank you.